So, okay, let me introduce our next guest. Um, so on Eye on the Target Radio tonight, we have Brian Hill from The Complete Combatant. Hey, Brian. Hey, how are you guys doing? We're doing, we're doing good. Let me get you tuned up so I get you in the right volume zone. So, okay, now talk. All right. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Now, now you sound like you're like a Verizon commercial. We're all good. We're, we're all good. So I was telling everybody earlier that there are eighty buttons on this panel that I run, and so it, all it takes is one person just moving one of them, and all of a sudden, all the all the stuff is is a whole new combination. But, so I always have to kind of tune everybody, and I hate to sound I have to, hate to sound like I have to do the background stuff up front, but I kind of have to. Yeah, it, it just makes you sound important. That's all. Well, look at this. I mean, I could I could have like a space helmet to go with ro- driving but, driving but this bus. I've flown an airplane, <laughs> and the guy doesn't tell me what he's doing and flip what knobs he's but flipping and buttons he's pushing. He just does it. He just does it. Okay, <laughs> but it's not dependent on whether he can hear you or not. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just I'm just saying, you know, it's it's harder work to be entertaining than it is to just fly you across the country. You know. <laughs> So, so Brian, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. So, um, so tell us what's going what's going on at the Complete Combatant. Um, your wife just cracks me up. <laughs> she's quite a ball of energy, isn't she? Oh, she's, exactly. <laughs> I, I was told you marry a ginger, you can conquer the world. So that that was you. You've got it nailed, then, buddy. You've got it nailed. I do. <laughs> she, she she keeps everybody going with all her eternal energy. So. Oh, man. I know. I mean, having conversations with her, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's quite the multitasker, isn't she? Exactly. So why don't you tell us, tell us a little bit of the backstory of the Complete Combatant and kind of what you guys do. You're located near Atlanta, but north of Atlanta? Yeah, we're about uh, 30 minutes outside of Atlanta in okay. Marietta, Georgia. So, okay. nice little quaint area. And uh, I ran a mixed martial arts gym. So, you know, I taught people to apply neck tourniquets, and stretch limbs, and punch each other and kick each other, which is a very rewarding career, unlike turning buttons and knobs, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, uh, I, I saw a real need in the industry to kind of have an overlay of the concepts that I had learned. Um, a little bit in police work and a little bit uh, through my own experience that you need to have more than just the gun. You need to have the actual experience of force on force, and you need to find a way to make all the aspects work from the, the first signs of danger to your ability to use a verbal agility to basic non-lethal techniques and using non-lethal tools and a firearm, and then more importantly, to be able to make a call for help afterwards and to interface with the police in a manner that would be helpful to you and your lawyer, and to understand the legal aspects of everything we do and apply tactical first aid if you needed it. Okay, so let's go back to the whole, that responding to the police in a, in a manner that is helpful to you and your lawyer. Let's, let's just pluck that one right out of the middle of that herd of things going by. Well, as we all know, it's very important what you say. And, uh, you know, when you've had the most stressful event in your life and you've had to defend yourself, um, everything you say on 911 can be used in the court. And when the police officer shows up, he has no idea who you are. He may think you're the bad guy. The descriptions may have gotten messed up. And there's some things that you need to do. And there was quite a bit of turmoil on the Internet where we get all good information about never say anything to the police. But the problem is, if you don't say anything, you'll be treated like a bad guy because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we wanted to get across to the people that we train is that you want to say a little bit to Mm -hmm. the police officer when he shows up. You want to have the ability to tell him that, hey, I was the one attacked. And I was really in fear for my life while I was attacked. And here's why I was in fear for my life. Uh, That man over there has that gun that's underneath the car. And all those people over here saw it happen. And I'll be willing to help you in any way I can. But I'm a little shaken up, and I'd like to get somebody to look at me uh, in a medical aspect. And I'd also be willing to help you after I had some time to think about what I'm going to say and get some legal counsel after that. And it gives you a good chance to practice it in an environment where you're under stress. Uh, all our clients know that it's not real, 
until they start trying to say those words. Right. <laughs> and, and, and our and our folk, force on force, they're jacked up. The adrenaline's in there. And if you're a person who tends to talk a lot, you can't stop. And if you're a person who doesn't have much to say, it's really hard to get started. And so I don't want your first time to be in the actual event. I want you to get some practice on it and get a feel for what's right and kind of a flow and uh, make your phone call and interact with one of our officers that works with us and you get a chance to feel what the whole experience feels like. And um, hopefully it will persuade you to avoid at all costs. And then if you do get in an event, you have to handle it appropriately. No, and we we agree with that. I mean, when we yeah. as we teach here in Ohio, one of the things that we teach our students is the fact that you've got to you've got to say something. But if if someone anyone, and we do this in class, and and you walk up to them and say, "Tell me what happened," and then you just look at them, and then you go, "And," yeah. and they'll say some more, and then you go, "And," and mm-hmm. they'll give you some more, and you go, "And," and they'll give you some more, and we. I, as a population, want someone to agree with us, want to see things from our point of view, and we'll keep talking, trying to persuade them to see it our way. And it's like, that doesn't help you one bit. So, you know, to quote Gordon Ramsay, you know, shut it, donkey. And <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we tell our, st- our students truly to say, I want that person arrested. Yes. And when you start that way, they're like, well, what does, that, what does that mean? Well, it has a lot of meanings. One of them is you believe you're right and you believe they're wrong. You have this inherent belief in the police and the legal system. You, be, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff just comes from, from a reasonable sentence. And then you ask for your clergy, your attorney, you know, and if you need taken care of medically, you know. Well, you're unfortunately the chief chaos controller at that point, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it's your responsibility to let everybody know what's happened. And mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a hard task to do after you've, you've been attacked or you've, maybe you've been injured or you've had to use force for the first time. And uh, it's an incredible responsibility to put on the armed citizen to have to be in control of his destiny and make sure that he doesn't make any mistakes. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the greatest things that we do is, you know, we use Ron White's quote in, in the class, a great comedian. You might have the uh, abil- you might have the right to shut up, but you don't have the ability. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that one's good, too. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's I better. It from Lee Ween, so it's got to be good. <laughs> that's, that's better than Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't we don't know anything original. We just we could just use everybody's everything. <laughs> The most sincere form of flattery is to thieve it, right? Exactly. Just put it in place. I'll, I'll give him the quote. I'll say yeah. it was him. There you yeah. go. So, so okay. So you te- so you teach people how to use guns. You teach people how to fight hand to hand. You teach. Where do you think when somebody comes into one of your classes? Where do you think which one is which segment do they get the absolute eye opening most out of for a brand new person? Uh, our original class, the Complete Combatant, is a 12-hour class. It's a day and a half, and that's probably the best place for everybody to start. Uh, I have a, a beginning class, which is called the Proactive Mindset, and that's where people haven't made up their mind that they want to be involved in self-defense or they want to carry a firearm or they want to learn martial arts. So it's kind of a teaser course where we can get people in, and they can learn a little bit about how to think about it and uh, we work some interactive drills with them so they start to feel it. But the complete combatant starts you from from the day one of understanding how to use your gear and your tools, uh, and you get to choose. You know, if you carry pepper spray, uh, we have pepper sprays that you can use, training at pepper sprays. Um, you get to use your firearm in a disabled manner. You get to use your equipment to see if it works. Um, and we start with verbal skills, and we work How do you walk? How do you stand? How would you interact with somebody in a non-lethal position? And understanding how that goes for them is very difficult at the beginning. I I found that people love to shoot, but they really can't talk to each other in a meaningful manner. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're right. You're right. You're right. So you were involved. You were a police officer. You were involved with the police. You trained with police. How 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 did the men in blue play into your world? 
Well, I was a reserve officer for the Fulton County Sheriff's Department here, which is part of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, really my, my duties were related to directing traffic and such, but uh, got some time around the jail and got to do mm-hmm. some work with the Sheriff's Department. And then a large majority of my class is law enforcement officers from downtown Atlanta because they're constantly in the mix. And uh, mm-hmm. we have them come in and help with our class from time to time, too. Mm-hmm. So. We get a lot of data from them and what's going on in the streets with people and how people are interacting and things to look for. But they also come in and they play the actual police officer. So um, it's quite an honor to have some actual law enforcement guys with real experience coming into the class and, you know, giving their their information. And I think it's really good for the armed citizen to interact with law enforcement in that manner um, because then they see him as, as a coach and as a friend, but they also understand what the job of the officer that does and how much he's under chaos when he comes in because he has no idea what the situation is. Mm-hmm. And uh, it starts a meaningful um, relationship. Uh, we have uh, Chief Deputy Lee Weems come in and do his first-person contact with police officers, and uh, it's very interesting to understand your rights, you know, what constitute probable cause, uh, what's articulable suspicion with a police officer, and what your rights are. And to have it from a law enforcement guy, it's interesting. Um, you know, he says that there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States, and they all do things a little differently. And it's interesting to understand that mm-hmm. uh, from a citizen's point, because they just think the police do the police thing. But it's a little different from each group to each group. <laughs> the so police you have to have thing. a general plan. <laughs> the, well, they just do police stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's like on TV, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm always amazed by people who are like, well, you know, he's not the boss of me, and, I, you know, I know my rights. You don't know jack squat right. about what your your rights really are, and primarily it is to shut up and not get billy clubbed. Most people until- who say they know their rights usually don't know anything at all about their rights. Otherwise, they really learn to shut their mouth a long time ago. No. <laughs> well, you know, we'll actually handcuff people in, in class. Um, we'll okay. have them put their hands behind their back and uh-huh. handcuff them and have to sit them on the side. And they look at us, but I'm the good guy. And, uh, you know, the officers will explain, hey, listen, this is for your safety and my safety. Or, uh, and they'll ask them, I had to arrest. And they said, yes, you are at this point. You're not free to go. And we have to figure out what happened here. And it's a very unsettling moment because uh, I think, uh, you know, the concealed permit carriers the most law-abiding part of the population Mm -hmm. and they expect to be treated as such Uh, they're good guys they've gone out there and gotten their permit Um, they're responsible they carry in a responsible manner so they expect the police to understand that it's a good guy sitting there but it takes a while to sort through that it does and the the thing is is that i don't think i think a lot of people don't understand that in the height of the moment, everybody's trying to, they're drinking from the fire hose, they're trying to absorb as much as possible, sort out what's going on, and with everybody trying to data dump at exactly the same moment, you can't do it. The big thing is, is, is you've gone through all your training and everything, you, you think you're the, you're doing it right, and then here they're going to handcuff you, so right away, now, now you're not sure if you're doing it right again now you're in and second you're somewhat, grade and you just got grounded right, um, i just got <laughs> yep. called to the principal's office and uh, things aren't going so good for me again so there's a spot in there where if they could just let them sit without the handcuffs everybody would get along much better i think except you can't necessarily trust if he's a good guy or a bad guy and frankly if i'm the police officer i want to go home tonight so my job is to sort through and figure out who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and who's the guy most likely to kick my teeth in. So you just have to put up with all the crabby old ladies that you handcuffed on the side of the there you street go. because uh, they sucks think to be them that time that day, you know. <laughs> well, hopefully they use a little discretion. You know how many guilty people are in jail, right? Uh, yeah, none. Ask their mom. None. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask their mother. He didn't mean it. He was a good boy. <laughs> That's right. Right. I mean, we just we're we're having a, a situation here in Ohio where a good boy just shot two police officers and killed them n- down near Columbus, mm-hmm. and his best friend bought him the gun because the good boy was a um, a convicted felon. But right. he didn't mean any harm. He was just beating his wife and shooting police officers. Yes. That's you insane. Know, it's, it's so tough. You deal with the worst 10% of the population, 
And the type of police officers that are going to be hired now are going to have squeaky clean records, and they really haven't ever been, uh, have experienced any sort of violence outside of what they'll do in the academy. And they're thrown into this mess, and it is a very difficult job. Um, you know, you get certified with your pepper spray once, but you may qualify with your firearms twice a year. Um, and it's a very low level of training to mm-hmm. get out on the streets and do this. And we're finding, you know, with the huge cuts in budget that a lot of police officers are traveling by themselves now. You know, they're doing mm-hmm. solo patrol. And can you imagine when you get out of the academy, all they've told you in the academy is you're going to get killed. You know, everything you do will get Wait. you killed. And it's such a hard job and it takes so much training. And uh, it, it, you really have to have a good sense of people and how to work with them. And, um, I, you know, my hat's off to people that do it. It was It's an incredibly tough job. It, and, it is, uh, and you've got, you've got to be fearful. And if, and you, yes. if you don't have friends who are, like, skate on that gray edge of the law, you yeah. have no idea what, what they're capable of. I mean, so normal people don't think like criminals do? No. Mm-hmm. And, uh... No, not at not at not at all. I um yeah, I had a I had a work experience where I was a plant manager at a company that was very very much downtown. And um I'm way too rural to understand most of the things that that were their everyday life. It was amazing to me, just absolutely eye opening. You know, be honest now, uh I would probably not get on the force if I applied today. I came from a troubled home. Uh, I'd gotten in some trouble when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, I had a pretty good sense of what the street was like. And I'd had, you know, a lot of run-ins. And I'd had lots of traffic tickets and um, things that they won't, simply won't allow anymore in a police officer to get on because they, they really need to make sure they get somebody that's absolutely clean coming into that apartment. But a person that's had a little experience on the rougher side of life usually makes a better law enforcement officer. Because he understands the people he's going to work with. He understands the signals and the dangers, and he also knows how to talk to them better because he's had some real experience in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I mean, we, we did a, um, a thing here with um, with police officers, and we brought in like seven different organizations from, from the bigger city to the very rural, and the yeah. police that... And they said one of the biggest issues that they've got is finding officers who don't have a drug conviction or a felony. That that in the in the younger citizens, it's kind of like, oh well, you you know, you're going to have one of the two of those before you before you grow up. uh, It's a good to have a couple felonies because it gives you some street credit. Yeah, Yeah, I think I'll pass, (laughs) man. So, I was talking to a recruiter the other mm-hmm. day, and he said that he can't get kids into the military right now because either they're too overweight, they're not bright enough to pass the test, or they're they're doing drugs, mm-hmm. or they're doing all three. And he yeah. said they're only getting about fifteen percent of the recruits actually through the program now, and so it's you know it's a real problem um, right. with our young people. You know, I, I've in my gym I have kids that come in that simply can't do a pull up anymore. You know, they can't do a push-up. Um, they've never really competed against somebody that's trying to compete against them, you mm-hmm. know, and resisted them. So it's a very different culture sometimes, um, with pe- especially with younger people, how they interact. And that's one of the greatest things in, you know, just, uh, on the side note with our mixed martial arts program is we give mm-hmm. them a chance to get some physical resistance against each other. And then if a child has problems or he's out of shape, or he's on a bad path, it gives us a chance to counsel him and help him and grow and work on those things that are going on in his life. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's a really important part of, uh, uh, I want to say, the warrior culture. You know, I consider all of us warriors that that face challenges head on, that we want to share time with the younger generation and help them as much as we can instead of just saying, oh, these millennials, you know. Mm -mm. I know they speak a different language, but they do need some help now. Yeah, I I just I'm not sure about the different language. I just am sometimes <laughs> like I'm, I'm, golly, I'm way too old to understand yeah. this. Like now I know what my mother felt like. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, do they even do like a physical education classes in school anymore, or have they done away with all that because of the you'll make somebody feel bad, or somebody will start to stink by second period, and they can't. 
him yeah, in front of their friends or something. I know for the state of Georgia, um, you know, we're ranked like the 49th in the nation. <laughs> so we really have to work to keep those stats up. Um, and they, <laughs> they have put a lot more homework on the kids. So I have kids that come in and have four or five hours of homework. And they've cut, if they have any recess or physical education, it's down to once or twice a week. And, you know, asking a young man to sit still for eight hours a day and then go home and study for four more hours is like asking a cat to go swimming. They're just not going to be able to do it very well. So it's it's a real change. And, you know, we're trying to overcome poor quality with a lot more quantity here. And, yeah. you know, we're going to make you study. We'll make you do homework. We'll make you do busy stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of good tests that show that people that are physically active actually score better on tests because their brain gets a chance to reset and, and relax for a little while and work on the problem subconsciously instead of just actively sitting there. But so. also, too, if they have a whole class of marshmallows versus a whole class of uh, physically right. fit um, athletes, which one's easier to control from beating each other up? That's right. So. <laughs> yep, you're right. The athletes are. You know, they have more to lose, too, usually, mm -hmm. um, with their coaches. And, you know, they're going to run sprints and do burpees and, and get in trouble and they have something to lose. So it's a great self-esteem builder for people to be involved with it. Yeah, imagine. I can't Im I I don't know. I Sometimes I'm just like, I just don't know where we're going and I don't know when we're going, how we're going to know when we get there because it's like, is this, are we just on this fast track that's spiraling downward? Because it, it doesn't seem like that what you're describing schoolwork wise is good for us, is but good for anybody. If you look at the army, noticed this in the, in the fifties that the, that the farm boy mentality and was going away and they were starting to get this inner city youth that it really didn't have the muscle and the mm -hmm. wherewithal to uh, do the type of work that well they, they had to change firearms specifically right, because and, and some of the training programs and that just because of the the way the recruits that they were getting so um now think about when we were kids they you could go to jail or you could go to the army now the army doesn't want you unless you're ready to go to college or the army one of the two they uh the army's smarter than it used to need to be i guess is, uh, with everything yeah. being electronic and computer controlled and drones and missiles and all this stuff mm -hmm. they don't need only so many pancake flippers before they got that line full <laughs> they don't, yeah they don't need just just they don't need just brawn yeah right. okay makes sense yep so what else you've got going on <laughs> we've got all sorts of things going on i hear your uh, plate's pretty full yeah, that's for sure. Um, you know, we're doing a pistols essential class where we, we do firearms training also. And then uh, uh, we have a uh, close quarter decisions class, which is basically a weapon retention and uh, uh, takeaway class. Now, where can, folks, where can folks find those? Um, it, all of this is under the completecombatant.com. Okay. So we make it super simple. And uh, you talk to my wife. She is the social media maven now. So... I believe, I believe on the paperwork that I have, it says that the, she's the TCC Headquarters Indispensable Organizational Wizard is how she, her headline <laughs> puts it. So. That's, that's, that's what I dubbed her. <laughs> the IOW, the Indispensable Organizational Wizard. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a knuckle dragger, obviously, and... Uh, and I excel in my areas, but uh, it's hard to be good at everything, and uh, we make a perfect team because she's really good at the things that I falter at. And uh, she, she, she puts the information out there, and she organizes it. She makes contacts with people, and uh, I get to stay on the mats or the range and do all the work and, and, and teaching, which I really, truly enjoy. So uh, we're very fortunate as a couple to do it together. So when you say, I get to do the fun stuff, then she says, I get to do the fun stuff. Both That's of you are happy doing the fun <laughs> stuff and not doing the other guy's fun stuff. <laughs> You're exactly right. I don't want any part of it. <laughs> You're awesome. Keep doing that, honey. <laughs> yep. Go, girl, go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so so there's classes. Now, do yep. you have a lot of people who come in from out of town to take the classes, or is that is that a new growth market that you're looking at because, because they sound so cool? 
Yeah, it is. Uh, we, we, we do get people from out of town, and uh, we also, you know, having multiple businesses, uh, we get a lot of repeat customers. Now, most of my classes are, you know, 30%, 40% alumni mm-hmm. um, because they find the programs incredibly valuable. And since it's uh, the complexity is deep in these programs, they want to repeat it so they can feel it over and over again. Um, and now we're really starting to gain a following for where people are traveling in and coming to classes. Um, it's very interesting. Also, my wife has been able to um, reach into the women's market. Hmm. And, um, you know, she's made great rapport where women feel safe coming to a mixed martial arts gym. Uh, to work out and to train and to get these things, and they and they just do a fantastic job. So it's uh, it's been really wonderful to have that ability to reach the market we want to reach and to help people that really uh, need self defense. Whether you know you're you're in your forties, your fifties, your sixties, you can come to this class. Men and women come to this class, and we're teaching legitimate skills that work for everyone, and they're simple skills. And it's really based on the pre-need decision plan, you know, where you can work through a plan and get an idea how this all works. So uh, our market is, right now, my classes tend to be 50-50 men and women, mm-hmm. which is very unusual. And uh, it's excellent because they get to work against each other, and that gives them a great chance to really grow and improve. So um, we are starting to expand. Uh, I can't really travel because I have the business all the time. Uh, we do a couple classes out of town. But uh, if things keep going the way they are, we'll probably do more, much more of a complete combatant, and I'll do far less of uh, teaching 12 hours a day in the gym. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So I know that last year I missed, um, but hopefully this year we'll see, we'll see what my world looks like. Is, uh, the, <laughs> You're a busy lady. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's man oh man of I mean, there's there's kind of no doubt about that. Um, and um, and we're keeping our fingers crossed as to what else is coming down the pike. You know, that's mm-hmm. it's that the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think is how that is how that term goes. But you've um, been doing the work. Good for you. Uh, we've we've really been. Well, Rob and I have been doing our radio show for seven. We're on on the eighth year right now. And, um, you know, and they're like, wow, you're like an overnight success. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Did you ever hear the Cheryl Crow story about that? I don't know. No. She got she got Best Newcomer Award. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I'd really like to thank everybody. I've been here in Vegas for 20 years playing. And I'm glad I'm the Best Newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. It's like okay, it. I just I just discovered you. However that <laughs> however that works. So that's and that that's sort of kind of where we are. I mean, I, for years we went to Shot Show and it was just us walking around and we didn't know anybody. And in the last couple of years, it has just blown up. Why and, do you think that is? Um. Well, one, the women's market is really changing. And two, it was a one, for me at least, some really good advice that Rob gave me right after he called me a knucklehead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in, our ter- in our family, dumbass is a term of endearment. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, 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 so with Rob and I, I mean, we're a unique partnership because most of the time, everybody that you're seeing in the firearms industry is not... His husband and wife, maybe. I mean, for us to be brother and sister is kind of, they just look at us like, you guys are weird. But um, a couple of years ago, I got a call from uh, Diana Muller, and she was, she was a- actually, this first call was about the fact that there was somebody who was trying to do a TV show. And so we were putting in a proposal for it, and then they came back and they said, well, no, 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 we want to do this in three months, and we want a crescendo at the end. And we're like, we're, we're gun people. We do not want we do not want something that's big and exciting and a crescendo because the only thing you can imagine is something not good, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I cannot visualize an exciting gun-related crescendo. Otherwise, this doesn't involve somebody bleeding somewhere. Right? It makes me nervous just to hear the word. I mean, I can't. I can't. I just can't visualize. So we rolled out what what we thought would be a reasonable one, anyhow, and they told us that we were frankly too boring. So so we got past that. And then after Diana Muller 
called back and another time and she's like i've got this idea for this uh this group of of politically minded second amendment savvy women and would you be interested in being part of that and i was like you know i'm doing these fashion shows and i got the radio show and we've got the gun shop and you know and i have to work 40 hours a week and yeah i don't think so and then later i told rob i was like wow i got this call and it was really cool and i was really complimented but i told her no and he's like are you out of your ever loving mind (laughs) and i was like but i'm busy and he's like you're not that busy So, (laughs) so um so his advice made me call diana back and i'm and that's part of the reason why i'm on the dc project so that connected me to more women than you know we'd been kind of been moving moving around in the women's industry a, a little bit before that or i mean some more but it i to me it was like that that was one of the keys that kind of turned things and whether it was whether it was the cause or it was a result i don't know I, I can't say. I just know that uh, it was a door that opened and you needed to stop doing one of the other dead-end jobs you were doing and jump into that one. And, uh, <laughs> and that's how he... Uh, he but wait, he, you have to hear his other explanation of my dead-end job. So why don't you tell them about the fashion show dead-end job? Uh, well, she did this fashion show and then everybody copied it. So she decided she would... Um, do it again for the Friends of NRA local chapter. So I says, it's going nowhere. You're, you're wasting your time, spinning your wheels, nothing's happening. The next day she gets a letter from A&E saying that they want to come out and film her fashion show and make a one-hour documentary. I'm like, okay, now it's not a dead end job. <laughs> He's like, I was wrong. <laughs> I can't believe I said that out loud even. Yeah, oops. <laughs> a little early. <laughs> yeah, and then the A and E thing then led to the uh, to the NRA calling and saying, "Will you consult with us and show us how to do it?" So, so volunteering to help in that in that dead end job wasn't so dead end. <laughs> <laughs> you so, never know where it's going to come from, though. You, you don't know? know, and I think that that's the key to all of this. So, so circling back to you guys. Uh, well, another thing we've learned from some of this is that when something looks like it's going past its prime i mean it's starting down all of a sudden that's about the time the general public hears about it so you're three years ahead of a curve basically and when you start to see and that well it, it, it really didn't catch on and it's done that's actually when when you need to push harder i think at that point or when you think that everybody's picked up on it and it's played out mm-hmm. you know i i think that that's part of it is just if you're if you're the if you're the front runner and it sort of looks like, okay, now you've got all of these people following, then all of a sudden people are like, hey, I always wanted to know about that. Yeah, whatever it was. So, <laughs> so, so talking about that, tell me about, I don't know if it, well, obviously it's the complete combatants, but it's, is it Shelley's program? Is it your program? Is it, but the women's mix and mingle. Are you like the, the guy with the girl with the gun? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I did all this. No, <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to know: were you like the token yeah. male in the room? <laughs> well, we went to Shot Show, and they had a woman's meet and mingle there. And mm-hmm. Shelly's like, you know, that's a really good idea. And she loves networking, and she got in there, and she met a lot of great people. And we were talking on the way home, and we started kind of hashing out. And she's like, I really think I could do something like that in the southeast. And I said, What a great idea! How can I support you in this? And um, it didn't take much, really, after that point. I didn't have to do a whole lot except write an occasional check to help out. Now, Rob, I want you to remember this sentence, he says. What a great (laughs) idea. How can I support you? That's what he said. Write that down, because that's like a Valentine's Day gift that you can just open the envelope and read it to her. It's the same thing that we get, because he said, go go for it. And then she went and did it, and he pretty much just stand back and... uh, you go, girl, and pats her on the back <laughs> once in a while. And so you got you got the same thing, just the verbiage is a little different. Yeah, you call me you dumbass. What, <laughs> what do like, you think? I just, I'd call it steering from the back of the bus is what I call it. <laughs> well, 
you know, I'm a coach, so I probably use a little different work. She gets a she gets a pat. Get in there. <laughs> you <laughs> get in there. You're, you're winning. Run. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Get after it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I know that last year's women's mix and mingle was hugely successful. Mm-hmm. And um, that this year she's planning it even better, right? Oh yeah, yeah. She's uh, every every year it's going to get a little bit bigger and better. And uh, this year she's really got a cool thing going on. Mm-hmm. Um, she's got all the top people from the training community to actually donate programs from their their uh, training programs. So um, I think we live in the golden age of firearms training right now. We have you know better weapons and more opportunities and we seem to be better protected legally and we have the greatest training we can get so uh, i'm just going to read some of the list of trainers i can't believe the people that she's got to put in on this online raffle she's going to do but she's got shiv works she's got from lynn and tom Givens, TACCON, uh call Ren training masada you chuck haggard lone star medical uh, modern samurai project which is jedlinski with the red dot uh, active self-protection with john korea larry linderman of course, ourselves, William April, Beth Alexar, Lee Weems, Paul Sharp, Armed Citizen Legal Defense Network, Cecil Birch, and Spencer Keepers have all donated programs, training programs, and these are a full weekend, you know, $500 programs for most of them that you can bid on for, I think the bidding is like 25 bucks online, and uh, if you win that, you get the whole weekend of training, and this is going to raise money for Rachel's Rest, which is a non-charity or charity that we're uh, part of for women that have been sexually abused or have been in domestic violence and they receive counseling for it so it's just an awesome thing that she's doing with this and uh to get all these people on one page is pretty incredible well, that's that is amazing and um i yeah. she's just got so much energy and she's got so much drive and she believes in what she's asking for yeah. And so, because she believes, other people believe, and that is the key. I really, I really think so. You know, when you work with a, a nonprofit charity, and uh, you see the other side of this, you know, a lot of us talk about what we're going to do if we need to defend your, defend ourselves. But when you see the damage that's done, and the damage doesn't just extend to the woman; it can be passed from generation to generation, and it and it go it continues to go on. So, having a resource to offer counseling. And to improve this is very motivating and she knows how important it is for people not only to learn self-defense but to gain the confidence to make decisions for themselves and to step out of a, a, a violent cycle that could engulf them and their children and their children and um, you know when she talks about it it's passionate and you can hear it mm-hmm. and uh, trainers respond to that and I think it one of the greatest things about the firearms community is people will help they mm-hmm. want to help you, and right. uh, uh, they are generous and kind to a fault when there's a true need. Yeah, no, this is this is such such good stuff. I've got to circle May nineteenth and see what I'm doing and see how far yeah. away it is. Well, Brian, if <laughs> if she should happen to make it down to your neighborhood for entertainment, give her a couple of batons and have her show you her baton routine that she's been working on, and stand no. and stand back as far as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny part is I, I missed it all together because when you say batons, I think about batons we use in police work, and I was like, well, is that, she going to beat me? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is a friend of ours has given her these two wooden batons, and he's working on... Teaching her. me how to defend myself with a stick, right? And um, awesome. she clobbers the crap out of herself. <laughs> they get away from her once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, taking everybody out, including me. I, exactly. Well, yeah. Well, when I was in college, they made me take a sport. And luckily for me, they had trap shooting in college, so I didn't have to run or jump or do any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> so so it worked. Um, so this, this hand-to-hand stuff, man, it's hard. It is hard. It's a whole eye-hand coordination thing. I got yep. an eye, I got a hand, I don't have coordination. I and the other know. person's trying to kill me at the same time. That's yeah. bad. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Why can't we all just get along? <laughs> so so Rob finds me as his own personal entertainment. I'm just saying. Well, you know, we, we, we tend to do that with each other at back least, and forth here at, at the Hill Household, too. But at least she's <laughs> trying. I mean, that's the thing. That's how, it. how many other people have never even bothered or they they look at that and think well that's asinine and i i don't want no part of it and uh, 
Ouch. So, yeah. Well, you know, the hardest battle is to decide you're going to do something. And the next hardest battle is to get in the car to go do it. And then you got to walk through the door <laughs> and look like an idiot for a while. And uh, there's not a lot of people that are willing to even take that's, that risk. That's so the big thing about looking, <laughs> looking like an idiot for a little while. Yep. And, mm-hmm. and it, yep. it, it, no matter what it is, whether going to the gym for the first time or going to shoot trap or... Mm-hmm. Anything like this? It, it, you, until you know what the rules are and ha- what the, what's expected of you, you you, you got to kind of take a couple of lumps, I guess. Yeah, just laugh at it, you know. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Here I am. Watch me go. Yep. Yeah, something. Yep. Yeah. The biggest part is nobody else is watching you because they're feeling just as bad. <laughs> they do. They do. I, I don't have a problem with laughing at myself, though. So I'm like, here we go. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> pile on. You know. Well, I think you would have to have thick skin and a good sense of humor with this sort of job, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. I, yeah, some some of this is it. it yeah. You yeah. know, my day job is way easier. You know, I run engineering and quality in a union stamping plant. So tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm one of the few, yeah. few girls in a Teamsters plant. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you know some words. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Mm. <laughs> so, so the other thing that, that Shelly sent us is telling us that I'm not sure that I know who... Larry Lindemann. Lindemann? Yeah. Okay, tell us tell us who he is and what's what's going on with this that you're hosting. Uh, he is one of Craig Douglas's instructors from okay. Shivworks. So okay. he's part of the Shivworks Collective. Uh, he was a silver medalist in the Pan Am Games in Jiu-Jitsu. Okay. Uh, he was a lifelong officer, um, decorated officer, I believe. And he is going to teach a... Uh, saps and jacks class uh they are legal in georgia we can use a kinetic weapon like that and it's a very interesting class and claude warner who's a good friend of ours says hey i'd like to bring larry down here uh you guys would love him and um you know when claude asks for something we say yes sir as quick as we can and uh, this class is halfway sold out after one week's advertising which is just a wonderful thing Mm -hmm. and uh everybody who knows larry says he's just a fantastic coach and you know, people that are around Craig Douglas are usually top notch, like Paul Sharp and uh, Greg Elifitz and all those guys. And Greg Elifitz, actually, who does um, Active uh, Response, is coming to take Larry's class. That's how important this class is. And wow. he only teaches it occasionally. So it's a great opportunity. And uh, it's not his full time gig.
Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's a really cool thing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of places we can carry a sap-like object where we can't carry a firearm. So it gives us another option in the toolkit. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. Are we allowed to have that in Ohio? Well, if you got a bag full of quarters, you could pass it off as yep. your. But that's about the extent. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Georgia's got really great self defense laws here. Um, we live in a very, very good, good state for all of this. So, and they've really cleared up a lot of things for us. So we're 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 enjoying the freedom. <laughs> Yeah, we're Ohio. We don't have those words. Yeah. Oh, I know. We're, we got it better than a lot, but it's uh, that's what we, we were just talking to Charlie Cook from Massachusetts and some of the stuff they're going through. Oh wow! And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Turn uh, turn in your um, bump, bump socks. socks. They're wow. coming. They're coming door to door to get them. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with that. That's uh, <laughs> a hell of a thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us about the class of uh, lessons learned from watching 12,000 gunfights. <laughs> well, that, John that is runs, a great name right there. Isn't it a great name? Mm-hmm. Uh, John Carrera runs Active Self-Protection, the YouTube channel. And, um, you know, he's got something like 500 million views. And um, I think last time I talked to him, he was up to about 15,000 gunfights that he's watched now. And uh, he's a smart guy. Um, he worked on one of those subs that has the funny glowing radiated engines in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a smart guy. And what he did is he went through all these videos and he saw the common threads that happen in all gunfights and the things that are important and the things that are important and the things that we see for especially just citizens, uh, what they need to learn, what would be part of their training, um, things that we expect, how many rounds would be shot, how often cover and concealment is used, when, how often you need reloads, um, what works well, how many people shot one hand and how many people moved, how many people stood still. Uh, it, it, as a self-defense trainer, I can't tell you what a great tool this is because I use these videos in my class all the time because every time somebody says, well, that would never happen, I can plug in the video and go, look here, this is an actual video of this happening. Right. I would imagine that most people will stand still, they don't look for cover, they shoot one-handed, they shoot all their shots because they forgot to count or stop or look or do anything. and uh, Or they stand with their <laughs> gun and forgot they had one. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, gun, if I remember course. you have your gun. Yeah. I don't want to give it away. I just uh, I was at the uh, Range Masters Instructor Reunion, and he gave the presentation there. And I thought, man, this is a great presentation. We've uh-huh. got to get them down to Atlanta to have people come in and see it because it's um, you know we have verifiable proof of what's really happening in crime. We we know how the setup looks. We know what we're going to see before the attack. We know how the attacks are going to look. And what happens immediately after them, and it's it's very interesting. And of course, you know, you have to be careful with statistics because you know it's never the odds; it's the stakes. But um, this is a very important thing, and I think for a person who has limited amount of time to train, unlike myself, who can train all the time, um, you want to work on the things that are going to benefit you the most. And uh, you know, Claude Warner's done a lot of research in this area too, where you start seeing this is important and this is important, and you shouldn't spend as much time on these other areas. And you could really benefit from training in these certain certain areas and understanding them. So, it's a really cool program, and it's unique. You know, there, I've never seen anything like this one. Nice, nice. I would love to see that too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at selling other people's stuff. I wanna. I just want to not have to have a job so I could go do all this cool yeah, stuff. The funny part is, oh, he's, oh, well, he's got time, he's he's got plenty of time to train, and I'm like, I bet he you probably less is. Has less time to train than he thinks because his own less time to train like for himself. Yes. Everybody thinks, oh, well, I'm, I got into this so I can shoot more. It's like I shoot less than I ever shot, and uh, and training the same way. I mean, the only yeah. time I ac- actually get to train is when somebody's paying me to, 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 be, the, to be the trainer. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what cures that is obsessive compulsive disorder, like I have. <laughs> And uh, I actually got up early this morning to go do dry fire. Uh, I I think this year I will uh, average about 25,000 round shot um, between competition and training and on a weekly basis and teaching classes. Uh, But I'm also in the gym 12 hours a day, so I have breaks where I can pick up and dry fire and practice all the time. And I'm a compulsive practicer. Uh, My whole life has been nothing but martial arts discipline. So I brought that to the firearm. 
and uh, I find a way to practice, and I really push myself, and my wife says I am totally not normal, and there's nobody else in the world like me. So. <laughs> there's some of that. I would I'd say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a, a good trainer. <laughs> yeah, it makes, really. I have a Mantis X that I use in the kitchen. I'm sure that's, that's not every day either, but yeah. there you go. Kind Are you of, enjoying that? I love that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I nice re- to have metrics, isn't it? Yes, I, I really, <laughs> yeah. I really do like it. So, hey, Brian, I want to thank you for being a fabulous guest on Eye on the Target Radio. You are so engaging and so fun. And, well, it's um, a pleasure talking to you guys too. Yeah. I just enjoyed it so much. Well, good. I, I, I hope you enjoy it enough that uh, you'll agree to come back. Always. I'm here whenever you need me, so thank you for having us. <laughs> okay. So, well, we will be in touch, and I'm sure that I will uh, be chatting with your wife at some point because she offered to give me a hand when I when I have a chance to, to pop my head up and breathe. So, uh, well, you know, if you don't call her, she's going to call you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll hit that. But at this point, I'm in this, I'm in this, I've got this workload moratorium, so it's like nobody can talk to me until after the prepper's ball. <laughs> So, yeah. When I have a deadline for for the charity and a deadline for work at the same time, I'm almost it's there's no living with me. We'll just say. <laughs> so, so Good luck, Rob. <laughs> there you go. So, Brian, thank you very much. Brian Hill, the complete combatant.com. So, go check out their website, sign up for some classes, drive down to Atlanta and um get in the game. <laughs>